All right, welcome to part two on our subunit related to Greek art. In this video, we're going to be looking at archaic um, Greek sculpture. Um, and so we looked at some of these during class and, and compared and contrasted um, the chorus figures to the um, eventually what you'll see in part three, um, the classical and late classical sculptures of the Greeks. So this is one of the earliest examples of life-size statuary. The subject is a koros, K-O-R-O-U-S, which means youth. Um, and the plural, the plural form of that would be K-O-U-R-O-I. In both Egypt and Greece, the figure is rigidly frontal with the left foot advanced slightly. Um, the arms are held beside the body with um, the fist clenched. Body is portrayed as youthful and idealized. So these are very similar to some of the Old Kingdom sculptures we saw of pharaohs. Um, you know, that kind of idealized, lean body, um, yet stylized, and, you know, that sort of rigidness and stiffness. And again, the Egyptians and Greeks were probably um, trading with each other. So it makes sense that um, they would exchange ideas. Um, this particular... Um, type of statue is used as a funerary statue, replacing um, craters, um, those vases like we just looked at um, when, we were, were, when we were looking at Greek vase painting um, as um, funerary markers. They would often use crater um, craters um, and Greek vases as grave markers, and now they're switching to using these um, life-size statues. Um, Despite similarities to the Egyptian prototype, the Greek um, version does, does have some striking differences. Um, the artist um, has liberated the figure from the stone block, so it's more, more carved out, whereas the Egyptians left more of the stone. Um, this helps intensify the motion of the figure rather than the stability. Um, the male chorus figures are nude compared to the Egyptian figure that would have, um, that would have always been clothed. Um, and so, the, again, that's a pretty new concept, this idea of, a, you know, the nude body is something that the Greeks, you know, really saw beauty and perfection in. Um, and um, very similar to some of the archaic Greek vase paintings we looked at, they have that sort of similar um, face with the wide eyes and the sort of archaic smile. Um, they often have this sort of long braided hair that goes down the back, which was useful in sort of reinforcing the neck of the sculpture. So here's some other views. Here's a detail of that um, stylized hair. Um, so this was done in 600 BCE. Um, this is the figure that you're responsible for. It's a chorus figure. It's it's a type. So, I mean, I think you can see some similarities between the two. Obviously, this one is much more developed and a little bit more realistic looking. So, some questions. I want you to think about why did the Greeks artist render the male form in the nude? Um, so, this is a later statue figure. It was commissioned by a family who lost their son in battle. Um, two generations later, we still see the echo of the rigid uh, Egyptian stance um, from the earlier Koros figure. However, the artist has rendered the body in a far more realistic manner. The figure is more rounded, athletic. Um, this evolution to a more naturalistic style suggests the artist sculpt is sculpting from observation by actually looking and studying the actual human form. Um, the rigid pose, wig-like hair, and archaic smile still echo the earliest um, chorus figures. Um, the massive torso and limbs have been rendered carefully with muscularity. So there's that suggestion of muscle and, and tissue and, and the sense of a real body. Um, and this also is emphasizing this idea of um, heroic strength, which I think is one of the reasons why um, Greek artists sort of rendered the male in nude form to kind of have that heroic um, ideal. Um, and so the artist is trying to depict the perfect male body. So here's an evolution where we can see um, 
you know, the influence of the Egyptians, this should be familiar, Menkora and his wife, you know, that very rigid stance, the feet, you know, striding forward. Here is the earlier chorus figure. You can see that most of the stone has been removed. He's nude. He doesn't, you know, have the accoutrements or clothing. Um, and then here we definitely see um, that rigidness and frontality, but definitely more developed in the anatomy and more naturalistic. And so what's interesting is, you know, the Egyptians, you know, portrayed the figure almost this way for almost in, for almost 3,000 years, where here, um, you know, almost, you know, 100 years apart, we see, or 150 years, um, how, how much the Greeks, you know, sort of pushed this idea of the female, I mean, the male nude form and this idea of um, realism and naturalism forward. All right, so there are also some female versions of these life-size statues. Um, this is known as the Peplos Kore, um, so it's spelled K-O-R-E. Um, it dates to the same period as the Anavasos Koros that we just looked at. Um, the statue seems more of a votive figure than a funerary statue. Um, her body is rounded and clothed. She possesses the same motionless vertical pose of earlier Kore figures. Her bare arms, however, convey soft flesh and a sense of modeling and real bone structure underneath. Her hair and archaic style are considered less stylized. She would have originally been painted and adorned with jewelry and a metal crown. Her name comes from the type of dress she wears, a draped rectangle cloth pinned at the shoulders and belted, usually worn by young girls. Her missing left forearm would have, um, would have broken the otherwise stable static pose extending into our space. Um, whatever she held provides the key to her identity. So these were smaller statues and, and thought to be more like prayer votive figures figures similar to those ones from the White Temple um, at Ur um, when we looked at um, Mesopotamia. And again, here's some different perspectives. Um, and here's what it probably would have looked like if it was painted. Um, today we are accustomed to viewing Greek sculpture as bright, white, clean, and, and sort of fresh marble. Um, and, and that's sort of what we think of when we imagine the sort of Greek art. And yet we have known since the end of the 18th century that the Greeks painted their sculptures in bright colors and adorned them with metal jewelry. Um, the red garment she wears, again, would have been called a peplos. Um, and it is from this item of clothing that she gains her modern day name. And here with it painted, we see that her peplos is decorated with green and white pattern bands um, and its edges with this sort of green trimming. Um, it is constructed from a large sheet, the peplos again, sheet of cloth pinned at the shoulders and gathered at the waist by a belt. Um, by the fifth century BCE, wearing a peplos had fallen out of fashion. It may even have looked slightly and deliberately out of date when the peplos core doned it, do, doned it in the 6th century. This leads to interpretations from art historians that the statue is actually depicting a goddess rather than a mortal woman. So you can see how really different this is. You know, when we think of classical and, you know, this is what comes to mind, but, you know, this is what they actually looked like. Um, and they're, they're sort of the opposite of what I think of in terms of classical. Um, the colors are very bright, a little garish, um, but this is this is what um, how they originally looked. Um, and here's a comparison. I didn't really talk about some of the earlier Kore figures, um, but this is sort of a development of, of the Kore. So here this is one that's a little bit more um, the earlier and, and stiff. Um, you know, her hand is sort of, it's very much like Menkora and his wife. Her arm is, you know, extended in this gesture, but it's still close to her body. Um, here we have another 
for a figure, she almost looks column-like, you know, especially with these um, incised lines. It almost looks like a, a Greek column. And then here, there's obviously more development, more realism and naturalism um, in the body and the face. And then this is a later Corey figure. The one you're responsible for is, is, this, is this one. Um, but I just wanted to show you kind of the type and the evolution of these statues. Because um, often they'll ask you an attribute question, like can you attribute um, this work of art? And so they might show you a different Corey figure. Um, and you should be able to recognize sort of the style. You know, here we see some remnants of the archaic smile and the wide eyes and the peplos or the, you know, and, and the hairstyle. Again, um, uh, we see by the late 6th century um, that the garment of choice for fashionable women has changed. It's more of a light linen um, sort of um, sort of toga kind of style. The artist delighted in rendering the intricate patterns created by the cas cascading folds of the soft material. So here we really see how the artist is probably observing from nature how the drapery falls and, and would look um, on a real body. The asymmetry of the folds greatly relives the stiff frontality of the body and makes the figure appear much more lifelike. The artist has incorporated further variations by showing the figure grasping at her um, chitin, that's what the name of this particular dress is called, a C-H-I-T-O-N, with her left hand, and that has been broken off. Um, and she would have probably lifted, um, she's sort of lifting her, the idea is that she's lifting her gown off the ground as she takes a step forward. All right. Well, that went a little quicker than I thought. Um, so um, in our next segment, we're going to be looking at Greek architecture. So we're going to be looking at Greek temples and really studying um, Greek architecture. There's a lot of vocabulary related to that that you need to know. We'll go back and look at some later periods, both with um, sculpture and architecture. And anyway... I hope you, you're enjoying Greek art. It's one of my favorites. Um, please be sure that you read the textbook as well um, that you were assigned on Monday. And we will have a quiz on the archaic period. So anything is up for grabs on this PowerPoint and anything related to the archaic period in your textbook. All right. Have a good weekend. Stay tuned for part three.